Well, welcome, welcome, welcome. It's another episode of Dream Big with Jana, inspiring you to reignite, refire, and refuel your life. And as you know, my goal on the show is to bring the tools, the inspiration, and anything possible to reignite, reignite and refire your life in different areas, whatever is needed for you. So you can pick and choose. And today I am, we're kind of switching the subject uh, from everything that we've been talking before. And we are tapping into something that I personally am so passionate passionate about and I'm really really blessed to introduce this wonderful woman you see on the screen if you guys are watching us it's Audrey Sussman Audrey hi hi, hi. good to see you Good to see you too. So let me give a little bit of uh, background about Audrey for everybody who doesn't know or, or see her for the first time or hear her for the first time. She is a jam to have on the show, especially if you're a parent, because our topic for today's conversation is actually around the kids and specifically about the kids. We kind of ranged it really pretty widely. I mean, widely uh, from zero to seven there's a lot to cover from for seven years of age however we'll try to do our best and we'll tell you how we can get or you can get more of Audrey um, ask questions at the end of the show or maybe even during the duration of the program so Audrey Sussman PhD, director and hypnotherapist at the Anxiety Control Center, has been working with individuals and groups as both a clinician and trainer for 30 years, developing many dynamic, effective workshops from her experiences and research. Her approach has proved effective for parents and children from the gifted to the handicapped. Her passion is to offer tools that can change stress and strife to an ultimate calm and loving way of being. And this is just a little bit what we can say about Audrey, because there's so much more uh, to what she's doing. And we'll share that later, maybe during the conversation. From my point of view, I just want to say that this is just just the pure light uh, that is coming from Audrey's heart every time I communicate with her. And she's sincerely vested into, um, into her life's work, which is empowering the parents and the children alike. And it's just a rare jam. So uh, we all are in business. I know I myself am, I am in business. You know that I'm meeting a lot of people. But Audrey is something that is a treasure, like someone who is a treasure in my life. So without further ado, Audrey, uh, let's jump in. Let's sure. jump into the conversation. What would you say? Well, first of all, um, what led you because you you are a hypnotherapist and you've mm. you've been doing so many different uh, kind of outlets on how you are bringing your work into into life what led you to actually work with parents and children you know it's it's an interesting story um i moved from new york city to des moines iowa <laughs> and when i was in des moines iowa i was so lucky i got hired to write the uh, psychological part of the programming for children who were having trouble learning in the school system. And this is like the best job in the entire world. Number one, I got to work with people. But before I even got to work with the parents, I, they paid me eight hours a day to read every book I could put my hands on, on parenting, on communication, on anything to do with self-concept enhancement. Now, I already had a degree in psych, so this was my area. And what I did is I created a program that they're still using in the Des Moines, Iowa school system to make parents and children be able to speak the language that they both can. It's almost like parents and children sometimes speak a different language from each other. Translations. And, yes. <laughs> and by using these techniques, all of a sudden, parents and children were speaking the same language. And there was so much less strife. In the family. So that's kind of how I started. I was in my 20s 
And um, then when I had my own children, I had already been teaching parenting. So luckily, I was able to use the skills that I had been teaching Mm -hmm. with the parents who came to me with my own children. And I never, we never went through the terrible twos. Mm. We never went through the terrible teens. Um, So this stuff works. And not only did it work for me, but, and it worked for the parents I was teaching. But I want to say that for most parents, they don't get the manual when, when the child's born, they don't get the manual saying, Hey, this is what to do. What I teach almost as if you now have a manual that you can go into and say, oh, gee, my child is doing this. It's making me crazy. What do I do? And then you have not the exact words, but the techniques, the tools. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And it's, 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 I, it's, I call it like the Bible, you know, like the parenting Bible. Right, right. Yes. Well, you mentioned that you have kids. How many kids do you have yourself? So I have two children. I have a son who's here in New York City, and he's a screenwriter. And he has a screenwriting school in New York City. And I actually teach um, something called the inner game for screenwriters to get rid of blocks and procrastination. And so I teach the psychological piece. I don't teach the writing. Mm -hmm. So that's my son, Jake, and um, Jacob Kruger. And then my daughter, Karina, and she's Karina O'Neill. She's a doctor in Boston, and she works with people who have pain. Mm -hmm. And I have two grandchildren. And let me just tell you a funny thing. Ever since my, the littlest grandchild was young and she could speak, she, my daughter would call me and say, Mom, Mom, can you speak to, I won't say her name, but the young one, uh-huh. <laughs> and she's having a problem. And so we'd get on the phone and we'd fix it. And my, now my little granddaughter is 10, but a few years ago she said, I'm so glad we have Mom, Mom. I don't know what we would do. <laughs> so again, There was one situation where we actually cleaned up something traumatic for her. And it was traumatic for a little kid. For an adult, you would say, ah, for for a child. And we cleaned it up so she's not going to have to deal with it when she's an adult. Yes. Yes, it's amazing. It's life-changing work. Thank you so much. The reason I wanted to, because I, I know that you work with your um, with your son, and it's amazing how you created, you've created the team with your children. Yes. So let's jump into uh, what you just said. You said that you never had the terrible twos. So since the topic of our conversation today is uh, literally how how to be the best parent you can uh, from the moment the child is born, and it's a completely new page in the story, like in the, <laughs> or, or a new book, I would say, in the family history, right, or the family library, um, up to seven. But before seven, there's so much going on. So what would you say? How did you yourself manage uh, not to get into the terrible twos? And maybe even earlier, what would you say? Like, it's a loaded question, I know. But what would you say is the most important thing from your research and your experience and from your wisdom that people or the parents, the new parents who have the first child uh, have to remember? Yeah. You know, that's a great, that's a big question. This is a great question. And for each stage of development, we want different kinds of tools. So let's just look at the beginning new parent. Um, You know, it's funny, the parents who actually come to me for my workshops are already good parents. Mm -hmm. Um, They're the parents who go like, am I doing it right? Even though they're the best parents in the world. Those are the parents who I love working with because they're always looking for, is there a better way? Mm -hmm. Am I doing things in the best way for my child? So let's start with the new parent. We're excited. We have this brand new baby. They send it home with us. And unless you've taken care of young children as a, as a kid, (laughs) it's brand new. So of course we want to do everything right. And so the first thing with young parents is we want to look at, how do we increase our own sense of Mm self-confidence? Because when we feel confident, if the baby's crying and screaming, we're not going like, oh my God, I'm doing something wrong, which then makes more stress. It goes like, okay, let me see what is it my baby needs. And it's real. I I love using this as an example because there's a skill that when we call it, when the other has a problem. And even for a young baby, we do this normally. The baby's crying. 
Mm -hmm. So the first thing you might do is you might feed the baby. Baby's still crying. A new parent goes like, oh, my God, what do I do? You know, the baby's still screaming. Maybe the baby needs to be burped. So you burp the baby. Okay, it's still crying. So again, you go, okay, let's, maybe it needs a new diaper. So basically what you're doing, you're listening. Mm -hmm. If something's not working, you're trying something else. Until finally, the baby wants you to walk around jiggling it. And the baby quiets down. It's like saying, yes, that's what I needed. I just needed to be held and jiggled a bit. (laughs) So what happens is for the baby, we kind of almost naturally do this. Mm -hmm. We listen and we don't. uh, Let me give you the opposite example is let's say I have a baby in a playpen and um, baby's crying and you give it a toy to play with. Mm -hmm. Baby takes the toy and throws it out of the playpen. Mm -hmm. And so the mother goes, here's your toy. Baby throws it out. Some miscommunications happening. What happened to the parent who was saying, oh, that didn't work. Let's try something else. So the parent who has the skill goes, okay, and they maybe put a fuzzier animal in there. Or Mm -hmm. maybe the baby needs to be picked up. Or maybe the baby just wants attention, whatever it is. Mm-hmm. And, the, and the listening is, oh, and finally you pick the baby up, you burp it for a second. And oh my God, it just really had a burp, you know, like something so simple. Or the baby wants to be closer to you, you're in the kitchen. So you bring the playpen into the kitchen. So the baby goes, oh, there's mommy. Mm-hmm. So these skills that you normally do as an, with an infant of listening, we want to commun- communicate with the as the child grows. We don't want to forget that the listening is really important. And we need to get more and more advanced in our listening yeah. as the child grows older. Um, did that answer the question? It does. It does. I mean, for the for, for the new parent, yes, we'll we'll get into the terrible twos in a second. Yes. But what I what I love about your answer is that you shifted the attention from the baby into the parent. And that's what a lot of parents don't get. Uh, They're just not there emotionally because it's, they think it's all about the baby. It's actually about, you just said it, it's about increasing the confidence in the parent first. And then from that level of confidence to go and explore and have the childlike mentality to explore. Like if I were him or her, what would I want, right? Sort of. Exactly. Like, right? And you know, there's actually a technique that I use when I'm teaching parents mm-hmm. because, you know, we all come into life with our own little programs, our worries, our insecurities. There's actually a way to go from complete being stressed, you know, the kids screaming and who wouldn't be stressed? It's normal to touching your fingers together and all of a sudden your body floods with calm. Could you imagine how different it would be if you could just touch your fingers together and feel calm, yeah. even in the most stressful situation, it really gives an easier way to deal with the baby. And now when we're talking insecurity, I mean, we're human. We all have, I deal with some of the most amazing business people, screenwriters, famous actors. They all have insecurity, which we need to fix. Yeah. Because our insecurities start before the age of seven. Before the age of seven, exactly. Yeah. So in that in that space, uh, I think it would be the perfect segue. What do you think? Like, what is the role of the parent, in your opinion, in in raising children so that they can? Uh, kind of completely eliminate the insecurity and empower the kids. So what is the ultimate role of a parent? So it's a, it's a dual. It's like, on the one hand, we want the parent to feel totally secure within themselves. Um, And on the other hand, we want to teach skills so that the parent can have the child develop into the most self-assured, responsible Mm -hmm. human being. And so what happens is sometimes a parent's, they go to the permissive side. It's like the kid's crying, so you give them a cookie. Then yeah. the kid's crying, they want something bigger than a cookie. I mm-hmm. call it the bribery thing. It stops working eventually. Absolutely. Um, so there has to be better skills. Permissive, I mean, again, it's okay to be easygoing. That's fine. Mm-hmm. But being permissive means maybe you're not getting your own needs met. 
So sometimes we have to be, have, and these, this is the other side of the tools. The other side of tools that when you're having a problem, let me just tell you a story of my own daughter when she was, I guess she must have been about three, three and a half. And I, you know how kids are, if it's too quiet, something's going on. I walked out of the room. She was in the family room for a moment. And I walked out of the room for, I don't know, two minutes, three minutes, came mm -hmm. back in. I could hear it was really quiet in there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Come back in. There on my beautiful white lampshade is this black crayon. <laughs> so I took a breath. <laughs> Luckily, I had parenting skills. Sure. I said to myself, oh, my lamp. I really like that lamp. But I thought also to myself, <laughs> yelling, I know, it's fun. Yelling at her is not going to clean up the lamp. Mm -hmm. so what do I need to do? So this is, this is like the skill, like the ultimate, like when you put all the pieces together. Yes. So I said to her, Karina, that is a beautiful picture, but I'm really sad because I like that lampshade white. I really liked it just pure white. So anytime you want to draw, paper is for drawing. I didn't hurt her ego. Mm -hmm. I didn't have to yell. And here's the best part. She never drew on the walls. She never drew on anything else other than paper. Yeah. And we even, my child, I'm a, I like to do art. So my children and I have been doing watercolor and oil painting since they've been little tiny kids. And I'm able to do that because I was able to also set limits mm -hmm. on limits. what is acceptable to me. So there's the permissive and then there's the very authoritarian parent, do it because I say, and what happens with the permissive parent is we get to, we almost like, I, I hate to say the word, but it almost feels like we hate our kids because they're so abusing yeah. us in a way. Yeah. And then the authoritarian parent, we start hating ourselves mm -hmm. because we don't like yelling and telling because it's my way and having to be the, the jury and the judge. Mm -hmm. So there's so many skills in between. We want to be in the middle where yeah. it's not permissive. It's not authoritarian. It's a loving, caring relationship. And it's also, yeah, within the boundaries and you, it's the healthy boundaries that you, you are not just like you said, you didn't hit the ego, you didn't hurt it, uh, but you made your point. You made your point in a loving way. And that's a lot. I mean, I can't tell you enough. I mean, I probably I can because I work with kids. You know, that's, why, that's right. why our work is so similar in so many ways. And I can't tell you how many times I, I, I just... I just watch what, how the parents, so here is another example, and we, we are kind of moving into the terrible twos, right. so, 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 so called terrible twos. Um, it's basically what you've already described. So one extreme is when they are being very permissive and it's like the cookie or the toy, whatever the, the person is asking for. And um, the second one is, like I said, no, and that's it without any explanation whatsoever. And none of it works. So the real example from a real life situation, uh, what would you do? Um, it's a two-year-old uh, with a little bit of the speech delay, which I, I don't think it matters, but I will listen to your opinion. Uh, he just throws, he, he throws himself. I, I personally was teaching the class and he didn't want to leave. He wanted to stay uh, because he loves the class so much. And the parents, so he literally throws tantrum. He, he just drops his body on the floor and starts screaming and so the parents are looking at me and saying what would you do in a situation like that because it happens at home all the time mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so what would you say so that's a great that's a great one for the two two age two ish two yeah. to three and four because tantrums are they get repeated when they get fed in the word yeah. so it's hard you know there you are I've heard this in supermarkets the kid is on the floor screaming mm -hmm. um so you don't want to give into it mm -hmm. at the same time you want to be sure the child's safe okay mm -hmm. so being that like you put an example of the kids throwing a tantrum it's in the safe spot Mm -hmm. I literally, I'm not sure what you did. You probably did the same thing, but I would literally take the parents and say, let's walk over there. 
and just remove us from that situation and say to little Johnny on the floor, Johnny, when you're done, we're going to be over there without any anger. Yes, I said exactly the same. <laughs> I said exactly the same thing. That's what, in fact, I did exactly the same thing when my son was three or between two and three. He did it once almost the same thing. He threw himself on the floor because they're testing us. You know what I love to do? Tell me if I, if you would agree or just add to that. I believe, I always give the parents this image that the kids, they are uh, looking for a hole in the fence. Like imagine like we are, we are, we are creating this fence Uh And you always have to, like if you said no one time, you can't say yes to the same thing the next time because the computer program is just uh, not working, right? So if they can't find the hole in here, they will go and try to find, it's their job. It's their job. So they're constantly testing. And um, my son, going back to the story, he did it once. He He threw himself and I said, I just went to another room closed the door. But before I did, very lovingly, I said, Yanya, when you're done, please let me know. I will be in another room. Exactly. Exactly. Never again it happened because he understood what's the point. She's not coming (laughs) Right. I want want to add to what you're saying, but it it just brought up a story. And when we go into the older children, we'll we'll talk about this again. When my daughter was about 12, 11 or 12, she said to me, mommy, could you ground me? And I said, what does that mean? Because I never even did that. I said, what does that mean? She says, you know, you tell me to go to my room and you tell me I'm grounded. I said, okay, Karina, um, you're grounded, go to your room. And when you're done being grounded, just come out. So why did she want that? So now she could tell her friends that she was grounded. It was the funniest thing. She went to her room and about three minutes later, she came back out and she says, okay, (laughs) but you know, the kids want to be like their peers. So like, yeah, I don't do that, but it worked for her. But then, you know, the hole in the fence, I'm going to shift that just a tad. Yes. I, I like to look at it more like, you know, a child, you know, when they have passion, they have so much passion. Mm-hmm. When they're on the ground, they're not thinking, how could I force? Well, they are. I, they're not thinking, how can I force mommy to do this? They're thinking, I want this now. Sure. And they're using all their passion. So by walking away, they're learning that's not the tool to use to get what you need. But there's one extra piece. Mm -hmm. pieces later when the child's quiet you say this is the act of listening part remember I was talking about listening skills and there's really an art to this I'm making it simple but there's an art you would definitely want to go to the child and say later wow and you're what you're doing is you're reading not what they were doing but what they might must have been feeling Mm -hmm. you really were angry before Mm-hmm. when you couldn't have the cookie or the truck or whatever they were, you were sure angry. And then the kid might say to you something completely different than what you thought. Mm-hmm. And when I've worked with kids, um, of, once they get verbal, I've had children tell me something when in, you know, I've worked in the school system, I work privately. I've had kids tell me things that you would never believe that was underneath this yelling and screaming. Mm. And, you know, all of a sudden the child says to you, my teacher told me I was stupid. And you have no idea that that tantrum had nothing to do with the cookie unless you have the tools. Now this comes into the, like a little bit later in the five, six, seven, eight year olds. But if you know how to listen, you're going to get things that, you really want to know um, with the twos and we we're talking about terrible twos. Why doesn't, why can we miss that terrible two period? When you use the skills of what I just said, kind of like, boy, you were really angry. Mm-hmm. The child feels heard. Yes. And then the child, when you want something, the child might buy in even if they don't agree that it's your right to tell them to clean their room, they might buy in because they feel you care about them enough. Okay. 
can I can I share one? It's 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 incredible what you said. And and if you guys, everybody who's watching or listening, if you can get at least one thing from what uh, from this conversation today, from Audrey's wisdom, it would be the active listening. And I the, the story that came into mind right now. I was at an event not that long ago, a couple of couple of years ago three years ago and there was one mom who would stand up it was not a parenting event it was just uh, an event for you know speakers and uh, my uh, one mom she she stands up and she says um, my son up until 20 years old he was not speaking at all and he had he was diagnosed with a disease I don't remember the name to it mm -hmm. and uh, he just refused selective speak. mutism the, or something with like the, that with the parent mm -hmm. and all of a sudden they were, what, what, let me let me change that a little bit every time they would uh, she would try to speak he would go into a fight with her and she would mm -hmm. fight back and fight back and fight but when we're talking about the older children sure. but it just all boils down to what you said and she said until one day i was so fed up with fighting I decided just to sit there and listen and after that the, the the disease that was considered to be fatal was gone and she said what happened and he said mommy I finally you finally heard me wow and it just put tears in my eyes seriously at 20 so if you guys I mean this is what Audrey is talking about, listening, listening. And of course, like you said, the, this whole art to it, I don't know if you maybe can um, maybe do one or two quick tips on what they can sure. use okay. um, on listening specifically for this age group from, from zero to seven. Um, that is the skill that is going to be upgraded and upgraded later in life. Yes. But that's when you start with so could you share some tips you know what I'm going to share is I think that you know it sounds easy mm -hmm. oh sure listening's easy but if you think about it in the moment when things are going wrong we want we lose it we we want to get our knees wet we don't want to be embarrassed because the kid is screaming on the ground we, we start thinking to ourselves oh my god they're going to think I'm a bad parent you know all these thoughts that go in our own mind is what keeps us from actually being there for the child. So here's my tip. Mm -hmm. How do you know when to use the skill of active listening, which is listening for the feelings under the words? Mm -hmm. If steam is coming out of the other person's ears, if they're jumping up and down, if they're red in the face, guess what? That means they're having a problem. Even though you might be thinking it's your problem because it's your kid having a tantrum, that means you're, that's the time to either remove yourself from the situation if it's a tantrum or if the child's saying, you know, at a four, four or five year old, sometimes very passionate, will say, I hate you. Mm -hmm. And if you say to the parent, don't talk to me like that, guess where that feeling goes? It gets stuffed down inside. Yeah. Remember, feelings are fleeting. That second, the kid might hate you, but they don't really hate you. The fact that a child could even say that means you're a good parent. That yeah. means they can trust that you're not going to beat them to a pulp. Yeah. So kids who are afraid of their parents, they never say that, but that, that's not a good thing. Mm -mm. So if your child says something that's hurtful, first step, always err in the side of listening for the feelings underneath. Now, the tip for the parent is you need to get yourself out of the situation, almost like psychologically out of the situation mm -hmm. you're still in the same room so um it's there's a a, a technique of hypnosis called distancing mm -hmm. and the sim i'm going to give you the simple the simple way of doing distancing is you just imagine you take a breath you let it out and you do it three times before you speak you recognize that you're having the feelings and you imagine that you're floating way up high in a soft white fluffy cloud and you're looking at you in the situation. And then the second piece, this is like I'm combining a lot of tools. Yeah. You almost imagine that there's this, like this voice of the, all that is coming to you saying, you're a good parent. This has nothing to do with your parenting skills. The child is having a problem. 
And your job as a parent is to look for the good in the child. Mm -hmm. So, oh, and when I say good, I don't mean being good. I mean, look for the positive. So to give you an example of how to do this. So I was working in a school system and these were little first and second graders. And these were the, what they used to call them problem kids, which I love because they were kids who had problems and um, sometimes would hit each other and do those things and they weren't learning. So I had these, I think I had seven little boys in my class and little, I'll make up names, little Johnny hit little Jim and little Jim's on the floor crying. Now, what Johnny's used to is people yelling at him. Mm -hmm. I went over it and I put my arms around little Johnny, the one who hit little Jim. And I said, Johnny, you must feel so terrible that Jimmy's on the floor crying. And I didn't know what he'd say, but he said to me, yes, he took my toy. And now, now I hit him. Yes, I did. And I'm glad that I, I wanted my toy, but I do feel bad for one second in that kid's life. Somebody look for the good in him. Mm. Yeah. And again, even if he would have said, yes, I'm glad, I would have had the next step, which would be, you were so angry. That's active listening. You were so angry that Jimmy took your toy that you wanted to hit him. And we would have just kept going like that until finally he might have come up with a better solution on his own. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, there's a step-by-step -step process. It's called the blueprint for change that I teach. So that's kind of... Does that give a kind of a good overview for a tip? Very good. Yes. It's all familiar to me. Of course. Yes, absolutely. Oh, yes. But for everybody, everybody who is listening and watching, it's, a, it's invaluable. And one thing, just like you said, Audrey, one thing is to know, like, we have to listen, right? We hear it all the time. But in reality, how many people do we know who really do? That's a, that's a question to all of us, right? Yes. Yes. And, uh, you know, we, we have busy lives. I mean, but at least just, you know, in moments like that, I think it would be just so much valuable. When I was at the university, um, the, the Russian psychologist, Vygotsky, um, maybe you're familiar, he's like world known. Um, he, uh, when, I was, when I was doing my thesis, um, that just got stuck in me. Take care for the parents. Take care for the first several years of the child's life. And the rest will take care of itself. So it's just so true. It's what you're saying. If we can assist in that and uh, be uh, not only positive, I mean, stay positive, uh, raise the level of confidence in ourselves. That's Audrey's wisdom, not mine. I'm just summarizing <laughs> what we've learned from today because we are about to wrap up. Um, and uh, do more of the active listening and root for the feelings and just give the child the space to be and also listen, 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 that would be a good start. Audrey, I have a question for you. If you got, well, if somebody um, from our audience have specific questions about their children, if you guys, uh, today we're talking about this age group from zero to seven, um, how can they reach out to you? Um, they can go to my website. It's anxietycontrolcenter.com. And there's a contact Audrey button. Or they can contact me directly by going to anxietycontrol at gmail.com. And I do take all kinds of questions. And I do have parenting groups. And I do individual. But if it's a simple question that I can answer, I'll either make an MP3 with an answer where I'll send it or a written answer or we'll have a phone call. So I'm very happy. So anxiety control at gmail.com is probably the easiest way. But if they want to go to the website and get more tips, there's all sorts of tips for stress relief on parenting in all different areas. And Beautiful. can I just thank you um, for your interview style? <laughs> See, what you're modeling here in our conversation is like, you know the answers to this, but you give your guests the opportunity to shine. And that's what we want to do for our children. 
Thank you. Well, with this is thank you so much. I know the answers, but I'm also staying curious. Also, Audrey, let me let me put the book. I'm curious because you add pieces to what I what Absolutely. I know, and it's it's just uh, you know I, a long time ago I shed that need to be right all the time. Yes. We are humans. Let's just throw this in the basket somewhere because there's always golden nuggets. There's always we can we. Can can learn we have different experiences you um you brilliant at what you've done i haven't read any book available out there on parenting i yes i have great relationship with my own children yes i teach but i just i'm as much of a teacher as i am a student so thank you so much for your wisdom you. any final tips kind of in my women with big dreams uh, group today Wednesdays are always, always, always about like, what is it, this one gem out of your treasure box? You know, like treasure box of wisdom that you've collected through the years. Anything like the last, the closing? In I, uh, you know, there's so many tools. I think a tool that maybe anybody might want to start with is actually settling their own body and mind. And if they want to do that, I have a seven-minute videotape. It's free. It's on my website. And it's a breathing technique that calms the mind and body. And then at the very end, there's a healing, um, energy healing. So it's free. It's seven minutes. Um, and it's at anxietycontrolcenter.com forward slash stress hyphen breath. And that's a freebie. And it's a good way to start. Because we want to start with the body, it's calming the body, because you can hear so much better when you're calm. Absolutely. Wow. What, what a valuable, valuable interview. Seriously. Thank you, Thank you so much. Thank you. We're going to see Audrey very, very soon. We'll talk about another age group, and that's going to be from 7 to 11, I believe, right? Yes. So from yes. 7 to 11. So we're moving up, and there's more to hear uh, from, from Audrey and learn from her. If you have questions, guys, if you have specific questions, we already know how to, uh, you already know how to reach Audrey. You can also comment underneath the video. Um, you can also go to YouTube. Uh, it's going to be on YouTube in probably by uh, tonight. So um, tonight or tomorrow, doesn't matter. Just share the links and the YouTube, like my name, Jana Spitz. Go and um, share with the friends who have children because the information is invaluable. If you have specific questions, and you would like to have a real-time conversation with Audrey. We'll tell you what amazing thing we can do for you. Just write in the comments below, yes, I want to have a conversation with Audrey. And we'll announce that in our next interview that's coming up. Please, please, please have a wonderful day. Listen more, stay confident, and grab that gift from Audrey about the breathing and staying in your body from her website, anxietycontrolcenter.com. Thank you so much, Audrey. <laughs> yes, we'll see you. We'll talk soon. Okay. Bye now. Bye.